folks and welcome to COVID chat with me Dr. Susie Wiles um, here Mondays Wednesdays and Fridays uh, technical issues permitting <laughs> to talk about the science behind COVID-19 and to answer your questions um, so it's Easter Friday today and before we get started I just want to acknowledge that it's a bit of a sad day here in New Zealand um, so we've had our second death due to COVID-19 um, and we just want to send our thoughts um, and best wishes out to the family uh, of the lady who's died um, and obviously all her friends and the people who were caring for her at this very sad time. Um, so before we get into today's show, uh, let me introduce Damien. Hi, Susie. Um, happy Easter. Hi. Um, very sad news today, um, obviously, with uh, mm. someone passing away from COVID. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, just once again brings it home, obviously, how important it is for us to stay on top of this and to keep um, keep working away and try and um, keep that number as low as possible. Um, but uh, have you had mm. a nice Easter so far, Susie? Um, haven't really felt like it's been an Easter break yet. Um, looking forward to having a bit of a relax tomorrow. <laughs> How about you? Yeah, someone said they definitely took the good out. They took the good out of Friday this year, uh, for sure. Um, yeah, so I yeah. thought um, we're, we're going to talk about vaccines this uh, this week. It's the um, uh, sorry, this on the show. It's the one thing that we haven't really covered off um, so far. Um, but remember, we're going to mm. be answering as many of your questions as we possibly can. Um, thanks for being patient with us. Those of you that tried to tune in at ten past four, we had uh, just another. We're just being plagued with these technical hitches, um, and so we've moved from um, from YouTube over to Vimeo for those of us that were trying to find us there. Um, so thanks everyone for being patient. Um, but we'll still get through, through lots of your questions. If you've got questions, um, nzcovid at gmail dot com is our email address. Um, yeah, let's start by having a look at the latest figures, Susie. Yeah, so today, as well as um, the death that was announced, it was announced that we have had um, 44 new cases. So a little bit more than yesterday, but still um, on our way down. And it's a, it's a good number to be at. We're hoping that it'll um, continue to be around this level or lower for the next few days. Um, that brings us then up to 1,283 cases. Um, so still, a, you know, pretty good number really compared to what's going on uh, around the rest of the world um, and if we look around the rest of the world I mean the situation you know this is growing exponentially and so it's now almost 1.6 million cases worldwide and almost half a million of those are in the USA so that is just shot to the top as the largest um, uh, COVID-19 cases that that have been confirmed. Um, so yeah, let's talk about vaccines because this is the, the big thing that we need. Um, and I guess we've been wanting to talk about this for a few days, but actually um, a question from Dave sort of pushed it along today. So he said, can you comment on the new way of developing a vaccine being worked on at Imperial College? This is in London. I heard Michael Mosley talking about it on RNZ. What makes it different? So this is a great question. So the traditional way of making vaccines is to um, either take the organism that causes the disease, uh, so the bacteria or the virus, um, and uh, deactivate it, so um, kill it in some way and give that to the person, or to take bits of the, um, of the bacteria or virus, so the things that our immune response uh, responds to, um, and give those instead. This, um, so the, the vaccine being developed at Imperial, but also some groups in London, uh, in Australia and in the USA um, are trying is the same approach, um, is not to use the microbe itself or to use any of its pro proteins, but to use its genetic material instead. So the idea is that um, there is a particular protein, the spike protein, that um, it looks like that's the thing that our immune response reacts to and recognizes. And so instead of um, using that protein, what they do with these genetic vaccines is they take the sequence for um, that protein, so this in this case it's RNA, and then inject that uh, into the body. And then the body that that's basically taken up by cells, and then those those cells turn that into a protein, um, and then that protein is the thing that our bodies need to respond to. And the hope is that they will do that. So this is a sort of fairly new way of making vaccines, um, and um, 
last year, the first uh, of this kind for a um, the related coronavirus that causes MERS, um, it, they'd made a vaccine this way and it um, passed its first safety trials in humans. So when this particular coronavirus um, started then and they had the sequence of the, of the um, virus, uh, very quickly a whole bunch of groups then started um, trying this approach to see whether it would work the same way. So what we know now is that a whole um, there's a whole load of groups around the world who have got ferrets and mice and monkeys that have been um, given these uh, new vaccines. Um, and the idea is to look and see whether they produce antibodies. And so that's looking really promising. Now there are also um, experiments, I believe, happening in monkeys where those vaccinated monkeys will be given um, the coronavirus to see this COVID-19 virus to see whether the, those antibodies and that vaccine protects them. That will probably be known in the next, I guess, month or two, maybe, whether there's any um, hint that that's working. But in the meantime, um, a bunch of those vaccines are now actually moving into um, phase one human trials. So in a phase one human trial, the idea is that you just want to check whether the vaccine is safe. Um, so a small number of people are given um, different doses of that vaccine just to see whether they are still okay um, and then they will also be taking uh, blood from those people to see whether they make these antibodies. The idea then is if that passes that test then it will move into the next phase which is uh, larger numbers of people um, and again to see whether they will make antibodies uh, and then after that um, there'll be the scale up and to see whether they can then be used in an actual and to actually protect people. So in order to um, help with the scale up and everything, uh, the Gates um, Foundation have announced that they are going to basically pick, I think he said seven or eight of their top uh, ones that they think are going to be successful. And they're going to start building factories now to start producing vast amounts of those um, vaccines, both for trials, but also for potential use. The idea being that then if, uh, if hopefully one of those um, is successful, then they won't have to start from scratch. They'll actually have a whole bunch of it already made. And then they can presumably pivot the rest of the factory, factories to making those uh, that particular successful one as well. So it's kind of an amazing time in terms of vaccine development. This is, you know, going really fast. Um, even if people feel like it's really slow, this is really, really, really fast. Um, and the hope is that, yeah, within um, a year to 18 months, we might have something that's suitable for, um, for use in people. So that's uh, that's basically vaccines. So let's get on to your questions because there are quite a few that are also actually vaccine related. Um, oh, do you want to say anything, Damien, before I move on to those? Um, I can I can say something. I can remind people that they can um, email us at <laughs> nzcovid um, at gmail dot com. Um, and it's and yeah, we're going to try and get through as many of your questions as we can. Some people have been asking us um, on Twitter, can we just do the show for a lot longer and get through even more questions? Um, well, uh, we could, <laughs> but um, we also we're here for we're here for the long run. We're here for a, a marathon at the moment, so um, at least another couple of weeks. So we will get through as many questions as we can. But we do appreciate yeah. the uh, the enthusiasm as well. Um, <laughs> and one. Uh, just one quick question. Debbie asked, um, can you start reporting live cases as well as the total? I would say um, we've sort of got obviously limited resources as to how much we can pull out. But if you wanted to go to health.government.nz. As in recovered or... As in recovered cases, well, live cases, I suppose, is, okay. is um, total cases minus recovered cases. Um, as of today, there are 373 okay. recovered cases. So um, that gives you a bit of an idea if you take that off the total as to where we're at. But um, health.government.nz uh, is where you want to be looking for that, Debbie. Um, uh, so, yeah, that, do, you want to, do you want to talk about that first question that we've got coming in? Can we get some comment on the much lower fatality rates in countries that have mandatory BCG vaccination programs for tuberculosis? Yeah, so I guess if you, for those of you who don't know what the BCG vaccine is, it is this vaccine for tuberculosis, and it is um, it's actually a live vaccine. So in this case, it is the uh, it is an organism, a bacteria called Mycobacterium um, bovis, which is a relative of the tuberculosis um, bacterium. Um, but this one, and so bovis normally causes uh, infection in cows and things, um, but this one many years ago was uh, grown in the lab over and over and over again until it um, lost 
lost all the ability to cause disease. And so now for so many years, this has been used as the vaccine for tuberculosis. It's the only thing we've got. It's not very good, but it is better than nothing. Um, and lots of countries, um, either everybody gets the vaccine or some people in high risk groups get the vaccine. Um, uh, and then there are countries that don't use it at all. So the, the vaccine is uh, basically given into the arm um, and it's usually given nowadays at birth. So my daughter was born in an area of London where tuberculosis was considered a risk. And so when she was two days old, she was given this um, vaccine. So I guess the important thing to say is that, you know, tuberculosis is this lung disease caused by bacteria. It's one of the biggest killers around the world. It takes a long time to kill people, but about a third of the world's population are thought to be um, infected and it kills thousands of people every day. It's kind of amazing. So um, in a bad way, obviously. Yeah, so there's this vaccine that is, as I say, used differently in different countries. Um, and there's so there was a report out that basically suggested there was a correlation between those countries who do BCG vaccination um, having a lower death rate from COVID-19. And so the question was, is, is somehow this BCG vaccine protecting people and so should we be using it? Um, so I actually went and so I did some reading on this, but I also went and listened to a really good interview by um, Professor Gerhard Wurzel from um, Stellenbosch University in South Africa. So actually my background is in uh, is in tuberculosis. That's one of the things I used to um, work on. And I know Gerhard very well. So we used to work um, together in London uh, on TV. Um, and he did a fantastic interview. So we're going to put the link into that because he sort of explains things in a bit more details. But essentially, the, the gist of it is, is that it's actually not clear at the moment whether this link is really true. So, um, for example, China which had a pretty bad go at the at the um, at the with COVID nineteen, they do have a universal BCG vaccine, and many countries like Italy and others in Europe also used to have a, a universal um, BCG vaccination until maybe a few years ago. So a lot of those people who died in the older age categories would have been BCG vaccinated, um, but. It has been seen uh, in certainly in many countries in Africa where children are given this, uh, babies are given this BCG vaccine, that it does protect them, seem to protect them against some other um, viruses. And so they're what they call all cause mortality. So the death rate in those children who are vaccinated seems to be lower than children who are not vaccinated. And they call this, they think the vaccine is involved and they call it trained immunity. So there is a potential way this could uh, hold out, but it doesn't. It doesn't actually appear when you look at all the countries at the moment whether it's really true or not. Um, saying that, there are um, currently six trials that I was able to find that are recruiting patients, five in the Netherlands and one in Australia, that are going to be looking at the BCG vaccine and whether it's uh, protective. Um, but as Gerhard says, it's very important that we don't rush into this because there is a very limited supply of BCG internationally. So this is a bacteria. It is grown up. It's a very slow growing bacteria. It takes about 24 hours to divide itself, unlike 20 minutes for most other bacteria. Um, and so his real concern is that um, we basically start using this to protect people against, well, we don't know it would be protective, but whether it would be protective against um, COVID-19 when it actually is needed to protect babies in, in Africa, especially against um, tuberculosis. So um, he's concerned that the, that, that will happen um, and it needs the experiments need to be done really well in order to make sure that it really is protective. So maybe, uh, and um, some of those trials are, are on, but um, nothing to rush into at the moment. Next question. Very good. Next question. We've got time for one more. <laughs> no, we'll be all right. Um, question from Adriana. Uh, will COVID-19 be worse in winter as more people are sick with the flu? Um, good question. We don't know whether this virus is going to be seasonal like flu is, um, but we do know we're heading into flu season. Um, and it may well be true that um, if people uh, maybe end up having both viruses, that it could be really bad for them. We just don't know. Um, but certainly the good thing is that we do have a vaccine for um, flu. <laughs> and so once that is available to all of us, um, you know, we're all encouraged to, to take it and reduce the number of people who will get flu um, in New Zealand. Just a side question on that. What is it that makes um, a virus more or less um, dangerous during uh, winter times? Is that because our own immune system is, is compromised during those times or the virus itself is, is uh, stronger in winter? I'm, I'm not 
not sure that's a that's a real thing. It's just the fact that they have the seasonality. So they um it, it may well be related to how we're um you know that we spend more time indoors, maybe in closer proximity. I mean, there's all sorts of other things that it could do. It could be related to rather than uh, an actual thing to do with the virus. It could be more around the transmission and how people are behaving. Um, yeah, so it's it's not necessarily that they're more virulent in winter. It's just about where they're kind of traveling around and stuff. Does that make sense? It does. Um, a question from Jason. Uh, we have a son that is eligible for the priority flu vaccination. I've heard people talk before about live vaccinations. Are we likely to be adversely affected by this vaccine? Um, is this the right time to be getting unwell? Yeah, so live vaccine, like the BCG, so a live bacterium, but in this case, it's been, uh, that's disabled in some way. Uh, the flu vaccine is not one of those. So the flu vaccine is, a, is an inactive vaccine um, made up of portions of the flu virus that are the thing that we want the, um, the immune response to see and respond to. And so when people get a reaction to the to the, the flu vaccine, that's their body actually mounting an immune response. So, you know, when you get a bit of a fever and you get a bit of a sore arm, that's a good sign because that's your body doing what it, it needs to do. So, you know, if you're one of these people who is in a priority group and you're either, you know, the Ministry of Health is saying, you know, please get that, that vaccine because if we can protect you from flu, then that will hopefully um, mean that, you, you know, you wouldn't end up with those two viruses at the same time. Um, question from Rachel, if there's no vaccine within the next 18 months, we have done variations on this question before, but I think it's an important one to keep um, repeating. How would we be able to de develop herd immunity if most of us just self-isolate? Yeah, so I guess this is, a, this is a question about whether herd immunity is a good idea. So herd immunity is the thing that is, um, it, it's, it's the phrase that we use to describe vaccination. The idea being that if all of us are, or if most of us are immune to an infection, then it can't transmit very well because there aren't enough people. And so it will uh, die out and it will, you know, that way we protect all the people who are vulnerable. So this idea of using this concept from vaccination uh, to actually control this virus, um, it's, not, it's not really clear where it's come from, but the idea was that, I guess, if it wasn't so bad that you would just allow the virus to infect everybody while trying to protect the people who are most likely to it, for it to kill, um, and then you would allow, you know, once enough people were infected, they would hopefully be immune, um, and then everyone would be fine. Uh, so there are a lot of, lot of um, I guess, assumptions made there one that it's not that big a deal which it is that big a deal two that you could protect everybody well that's really clearly not the case um, and three that it only really you know um, affects a small number of people or people that you could um, um, you know like it was thought it was basically the old so if you just put the old somewhere else then it would be fine it's very clear that more people have got infected it also is able to kill uh, healthy young people so that that's um, that's the way it goes so uh, every country that has started on the herd immunity route has or path has had to claw back pretty quickly when they've realized that actually it's not a good strategy because more and more people are getting infected and more and more people are getting sick and then they're overwhelming the health system. So the UK and Sweden are classic examples of this where they thought this is the route to go and now they're really regretting having gone down that route. So we're not trying to do herd immunity unless we have a vaccine. Um, because it's basically acknowledging that a huge number of people will die uh, because you won't be able to protect everybody. So, yeah, no to herd immunity in this we're case. Still, <laughs> we're, sort of doing, we're sort of doing the herd immunity thing right now, aren't we, by basically making sure that if many of us don't have the disease um, and we'll stay at home, right? That's a, that's a sort of flip side to herd immunity. Well, except we're not immune, so that the problem becomes <laughs> that we are all still vulnerable to the disease, and then we've got to keep it out. So we've got to manage mm. how it, it comes into the country and and how we get you know infections. Yeah. Until I suppose what, what I mean is, I suppose the, the most compromised people, um, we're keeping them away from the disease by keeping ourselves yeah, in away their from bubbles. the disease as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Indeed. That's right. Does the COVID-19, question from um, E, does the COVID-19 virus become weaker to the human system over time and therefore less lethal? 
Oh, this is a great question. Um, they're all great questions. So um, bacteria and viruses are always mutating. I mean, as, as we as is with us. So every time, you know, cells uh, replicate themselves, sometimes little mistakes get made. Um, and this is sort of what helps us adapt and evolve to new situations. So these mutations are happening all the time. Um, some things mutate a lot and really fast and other things mutate um, much more slowly. Um, and sometimes those mutations make the virus or the bacteria better at causing disease and sometimes they make them worse. Um, and so it's not true to say that over time they always become less lethal because they don't. It kind of depends on how they transmit and what they are. And so I think that idea, it's sort of a, an old one that was thought to be true, but it's not really, it's not really true at all. So um, I guess what we'll find out by the end of this pandemic, by, by being able to see so what happens to infected people over time um, and understanding what virus they had and how that virus had changed, we might then get the answer in this particular pandemic, what did happen? Did it become uh, less lethal or actually did it just stay the same? And the, the lethality was to do with um, overwhelming health systems or to do with, you know, the kind of uh, individual things about people. Um, have you got time? We, have you got time for a couple more questions? I know everyone loves the questions, and um, I've, I've got a couple of good ones here that I'd like to get through if we can, Susie. I'm all good. I'm still here. Okay, cool. All right, let's <laughs> yeah. do it. Um, question from Eric. Uh, this is this came in a couple of days ago, so I'm keen to get this one. Why is this virus so strong? Is it the fault of those bloody antibiotics being used? <laughs> So uh, this really doesn't have anything to do with antibiotics. Um, remember, they're medicines that kill bacteria, not viruses. Um, and then, so in this particular case, it's because we um, are encountering a virus that our bodies have never seen before. And so we don't have any protection. Um, and often with other viruses, um, you know, there might be some degree of protection because we've seen something similar. Not with this one. Um, it's also very infectious and it's very hard to tell, you know, who has it and who doesn't very easily. This is kind of unlike SARS, which um, everybody had a really high fever early on. So it was very easy to identify people and then isolate them and eliminate the virus this way. This is proving much more um, difficult. Uh, yeah, so um, it's sort of maybe to do with um, like it seems like some people, uh, their immune responses, their, their bodies are not able to deal with the virus. And so that's why they end up having a bad um, time of it. But for others, their immune cells do a really good job. And then they basically cause this sort of collateral damage to the body. So, um, yeah, nothing to do with antibiotics in, in this um, in this particular instance. We can certainly there's a, a there is definitely a question um, I want to cover. Yeah. There's one in particular. Um, can there's one I can cover so, because a question um, from... somebody has oh, asked it a few times. Yep. yep. We do Trevor's. Sorry. <laughs> um, so Trevor's asked this correct question a few times, and I just wanted to make sure I got to it. So he says that his um, partner is terminally ill with stage four um, cancer, uh, which we're really sorry to hear, um, Trevor. This must be a really difficult time for you. Um, so she, he says that um, basically he's been doing all sorts of things to try and protect um, her as um, he has to go out and get things. Um, I would just like to say that it sounds like you're doing everything right. So um, you're um, presumably her um, her doctors and things would have also given you some advice, but it sounds like you're doing um, everything you can. So uh, I don't think you're, um, you know, I don't, it doesn't sound like you're missing anything out. So just just keep, um, keep at it and, and do everything you can to protect her. Very good. Um, yes, Trevor had quite a long list of things that he did from wearing, wearing masks and, and gloves and washing everything and doing a great job there. Um, question from Jacqueline. Can two families go to each other's bubble? My friend and her husband live in one house. Her daughter and the two grandkids live in the house further away. They're under the impression that they can go to each other's homes to be together. Is that right? Well, then they're one bubble. And the Prime Minister was really clear about what made a bubble. And and so I guess the, you know, what we what we were asking from the very beginning is that that grandparents and grandchildren stayed away from each other because um we know that that children can carry this virus with no problems, uh, and um that those who are over, you know, 60 or 70 are more vulnerable. So uh you shouldn't really be doing it, but you know, because that's that's breaking two bubbles basically. Jessica wants to know on the Facebook, might the flu be lighter this year because of the lockdown? 
Yeah, we may well see much less of it because it's not really having the ability to spread, right? Because we're all um, we're all in our bubbles. So, um, and that's one of the, also one reason to sign up to the um, flu tracking website. So that is something that is um, tracking our uh, so um, whether you had a cough or a fever. It's normally used for flu, but this year it's being used also to have a look at COVID nineteen. So, um, if you're interested, get involved in that. You know, everyone can sign up, and then we'll actually find out whether that's really true or not. Very good. Um, well, there's heaps more questions, but we will. I think we'll um, we'll let you get back to your um, to the the Friday that's not quite oh. so good as it is previously. Or is that is that your phone going? Um, we're that's going my to phone. Uh, Lee. <laughs> perfect timing. Thank you, Susie. Um, again, we'll be back on uh, we'll be back on Monday, if not before. We'll let you know if we do a bonus show this weekend. But we'll be back on Monday yeah. um, at uh, ten past four um, on the Facebook. Probably on the Vimeo, we might flag the YouTube from now on because we're having some issues with that. So um, uh, come and join mm -hmm. us uh, over at the Aotearoa Science Facebook page or at Staff from the Herald and everyone else, all those other media that are wonderfully taking us. Um, we really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to leave, Susie, you haven't seen this yet, but I was going to leave you with some, a collection of some um, some rather ingenious, maybe um, homemade masks that people have been spotted wearing out and about. Um, we'll see you guys on Monday. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you.